of all, a little bit about uh, myself as well. So I work at the observatory and I lead the work on system thinking and anticipatory innovation. So everything connected to complexity, uncertainty and transformative change. And today, our goal uh, is to actually provide you an immersive masterclass uh, into the concept of what uh, mission-oriented innovation actually is. And uh, today, we're going to be joined by also the professor, the great professor, Mariana Matsukato. So you will also have the possibility to hear from four practitioners around the world on mission-oriented innovation change and listen to insight and uh, challenges connected to doing this work in a mission-oriented way as well. So we're going to really immerse ourselves into kind of the framing of the missions and how to get started on mission-oriented innovations within your country context. We are joined today by over 150 experts and practitioners from around the world, from 36 different countries. Uh, this will also include OECD countries and also the MOIN network, uh, mission-oriented innovation network at uh, IIPP. Uh, Rowan later on will tell us a little bit about what the network is about and uh, what their work entails. And our work doesn't stop here. So not everything connected to missions can be solved with a three-hour workshop. So today we are actually looking into the kind of the fundamentals, the definitional issues of the missions and talking around the challenges around doing mission-oriented innovation work also in the public sector and beyond. But on the 26th of January, we're going to take the findings of this workshop and also going to operationalize this work. So looking at in practice, what we need to do to implement this change. So we all hope that you can also join us on the 26th of January, where we're going to work on the tools and methods of uh, kind of contextual change uh, that we can all get started around uh, solving the complex challenges that we're facing. Some ground rules uh, to begin with for the workshop itself. Uh, we are, of course, uh, all welcomes, uh, all questions are welcome on the Zoom chat. Uh, you can put your questions and comments there, and also maybe an introduction about where you're coming from and where are you joining us from today. Uh, the chat and also the sessions will be under certain house rules. So please uh, uh, to talk about what we talked about uh, during this workshop, but do not quote anybody in terms of their comments or questions by name. We are also recording the presentations, so recording the sessions where the speakers are talking about uh, their work, uh, but we're not recording in the breakout groups. So you can be as open uh, in the discussions as you want to be. And of course, we will share the slides uh, of this work after the workshop is done by email. So we'll get in touch with you soon. So we'll run through the welcome. We'll hear also from Mariana's team at uh, UCL about uh, what, how missions work and from her herself. And later on, the specific examples. And then uh, on, we're going into breakout groups to thematically look at issues around evaluation and other topics. But first of all, uh, I'm also going to uh, say how the observatory itself is looking at mission-oriented innovation. So first and foremost, it's a great part of our innovation portfolio approach. So at the observatory, we uh, look at uh, four different types of innovation from missions and anticipation, adaptive innovation and enhancement-oriented innovation. And all of these different types of innovation are needed. Uh, but of course, mission-oriented innovations are those that uh, really help to solve the kind of urgent uh, problems and complex challenges that public sector uh, and also societies today are facing. So it's a very important part of innovation portfolios uh, in government and beyond. So we are going to talk a little bit about the portfolio approaches later on as well. For now, I'm going to give it over to Rowan and Reiner from UCL to tell us a little bit about what their work is about and how the MOIN network works. Thank you, Pirat. I'm going to pass straight to directly to Reiner for the first slide to tell us a little bit about IIPP. Can you move the slide on? Now, Reiner. Yeah, thanks. 
some of the Zoom didn't allow me to unmute myself anymore. This is like a new function in Zoom discovered today, I think. So hello, everybody from the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose at UCL. I'm we're very happy to, to co-host this workshop with OECD OPSI, uh, with whom we have been uh, working uh, around um, mission-oriented innovation uh, for some time now, and uh, we'll continue uh, the next year, as well as Peer Peer already showed. So just to very quickly do an introduction to our institute. So we are at uh, University College London. We are a uh, very new institute versus three years old. Um, but at the same time, I think it's really important to, to mention that we are a full academic department. So if you want to stick around with us for a year, for instance, rather than three hours, just you can enroll in our master's, uh, Master of Public Administration program. Admissions are open. Or if you want to stick around even for three or five years, you can join our PhD program as well. So um, so we do full research, PhD, education, MPA. And of course, what we are um, uh, really trying to reinvent, if you will, the academic department in is, is how to do and work uh, with uh, policy makers and public organizations. So our focus is really on how do we do capitalism differently? And we think for that, you need also different kinds of public organizations. This is, of course, what we are doing here today. So we are very much a practice-based uh, theorizing organization. We try to learn from organizations like yourselves. And of course, this is where our mission-oriented innovation network is really at the core of what we do. And this is where I give the floor to, to Rowan to talk more about this network, who, who it is and what they do. Thank you. Thank you, Rainer, um, and welcome everyone. And welcome all of, especially all of the members of the, the MOIN network. We're delighted to actually host you in this gathering alongside other members of OECD countries. Um, so this is a great blending of these two networks and we're really pleased that so many MOIN members were able to join us. Uh, we have uh, MOIN members in 80 organisations in over 25 countries and it's really lovely to see that we have people from 36 countries here today, even people calling in from Australia and in Japan. So there are some people for whom it is the middle of the night. Um, if you go to the next slide. We, the Moin, Moin network has been growing um, and is really focused on how um, institutions at an institutional level, practitioners do mission oriented dif innovation differently. Mission oriented innovation is really um, a new approach to solving the biggest challenges society faces from climate change to inequality. And what our founding director, Professor Mariana Mascatu, who you will hear from shortly says, it requires a market shaping framework more than the more traditional market fixing one. And that's very much the work of the mission oriented innovation network is that we, we work with institutions both in a bilateral way, but also connected through events like these and through smaller group gatherings where we learn and share and do this practice based theorizing, understanding how missions can really work in practice. And there's been a huge amount of policy impact through IIPP, um, large, starting with the European Commission where they have put the missions at the core of the ambitious 100 billion euro uh, proposal in the mission oriented research and innovation in the European Union. And I know many of you are guided by that particular framework. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, and we have a very um, a broad framework for how we think about missions at IIPP. We call it the raw framework. Um, it means that we think about things in a very holistic way. We think about the routes and directions, how to use policy to set direction for change, but also importantly, enable bottom-up experimentation. And we will hear from four MOIN network members later about how they are doing this and how they've set sort of infrastructure in place to do that. Organizations, it thinks about both how organizations need to have a learning infrastructure, but also um, take risks and have build the capability and capacity to deliver on missions. And we'll talk about that a bit more in the breakout groups as well. Importantly, assessment, governance and evaluation have to be different in the course of um, running and um, leading missions. So we will also discuss how to ev evaluate public investments so that we can shape markets rather than just fixing markets. And really importantly, it's all about finance and capital and returns as well. So we have to think about how we share risks and rewards because there is always a complex um, partnerships that enable missions to actually happen. So how to form the new deals between public and private sectors, socializing the risks and rewards is very much a key part of how to deliver missions. So we'll talk about all of these th things in the breakout groups, but if you move to the next slide, we're gonna do a, a quick woo clap, which um, I'm gonna ask uh, Pirette to, 
to do, which is sensing from the audience a little bit about um, how to how, where where you are on your missions journey. So, Pirat, passing back to you. Excellent. So if you have your smartphone or smart device uh, near you, or you can use your computer or Chrome uh, browser, so just type in www.wooclap.com uh, slash missions 2020. So take your phone and uh, go to the website that we have then, and uh, our also our team in the background is also posting the link in the chat, so it will be easy to also copy. And there, you, when you end up on the platform, we are asking you the question, how would you rank your expertise in missions? Are you new to the topic? Um, you have knowledge about missions, but no practical experience. Knowledge and practical experience, or you are a mission expert. Well, as you can see, we have uh, answers coming in. And you can see on top of the screen as well uh, that the address is www.wooklab. Dot com slash missions 2020. So great to see diversity in the room we have. And once you have chosen the answer, also push the button that submit. So submit the answer and we can get the answers in right away. So a couple of mission experts in the room. Um, we're going to hopefully find out who those are in the course of the session. Uh, quite a lot of uh, people with knowledge and practical experience, but uh, don't really feel that they have true mission expertise uh, yet. Uh, and the most popular group, of course, knowledge, but no practical experience. Uh, as we have seen as well, the countries are getting started on missions. And there is uh, a lot of interest into the topic of doing actually mission oriented change in a different way. So uh, I think that this is extremely indicative of the topic. And we also have uh, great to see that there are new people uh, interested and uh, willing to learn more about the approach in the room as well. So I'm going to give you uh, uh, 30 seconds to log in your answers. Uh, and do keep your smartphones on the same page. So when we get to the next question, then you can open the, uh, the same browser link and the new question will appear. So great spread connected to that. Okay, uh, everybody is now uh, a master on WooClub. So when we come to the next question, then you can join in on the answers right away as well. I'm going to give it over to Rowan again to introduce Mariana and who's going to give us a crash course into what mission-oriented innovation actually is and how to do missions in practice. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, so I'm delighted, she's a, she's a very busy woman but she has made time for us this afternoon and um, I'm delighted to, to introduce the director of IIPP, Mariana Masakatu, who's professors, professor in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at UCL's IIPP. Um, she is winner of so many prizes that we can't really um, get, list them all, but she was named one of the three most important thinkers about innovation by the New Republic and one of the 50 most creative people in business in 2020 by Fast Company and one of the 25 leaders shaping the future of capitalism by Wired. Um, her a highly acclaimed book, The Entrepreneurial State, debunking public versus private sector myth, investigates the role of public invest organizations in playing the investor of first resort role in the history of technological change. Her 2018 book, The Value of Everything, really goes, brings value theory back into the center of economics in order to reward value creation over value extraction. And she will have a book coming up next year, which really focuses far more deeply on mission economics. So I'm going to pass you now over to Mariana and hopefully she will be able to share her screen and to take nope. you through the concept of mission oriented innovation. I can hear you. I can't see. Hi. You, um, yeah. oh, you can't see me? Yes, okay. I can see you now. I can it see says you now. I can't share the screen. It says host disabled attendee screen sharing. Okay. It should, it should work now. Let's see here. Yay. Okay. So hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be with you. I just had a crazy morning. I first spoke to um, Korea, <laughs> had uh, hundreds of people in the room and then was just with the Palestine uh, 
uh, national authority around innovation. And that was fascinating, the kind of questions I got from um, that region around mission. So let me just find a way to do this. There we go. Uh, Rowan, can you confirm you can see the full screen? I can see the full right. screen. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I set up IAPP three years ago, uh, very much on the basis of what I'm about to talk about, which is that in order to have better policy, we actually new, new, need new thinking. It's impossible to do the, the usual way that academics work as they write brilliant papers and at the end they might say, oh, here's the policy implications. And we're very much wed to actually speaking and working with policymakers at the beginning, right, ex ante, because so much of them, the policy areas we think about like how you bring purpose and missions uh, to say industrial strategy, innovation policy, it's incredibly messy <laughs> and you end up learning a huge amount and that has to come back to the theory. So that kind of feedback between theory and practice, we're very much wed to that. And that's also why the kind of people we've been hiring recently, we call them practice-based theoreticians. So again, you know, really taking practice seriously and bringing it back to the theory. And the reason we need new theory is that so much of the way that we think about the role of the state, the role of policy, in uh, you know, modern capitalism is actually very problematic, this notion that it's at best for fixing markets. And so um, the you know, need for a better approach, which I call market shaping, market co-creating, was very much the sort of broad agenda around missions. And missions in some ways are just one of the many ways, the practical ways that we can implement this idea of market co-creation, public and private co-creating markets. Um, and having purpose at the center of that process. And I often say to my friends in the policy making community, including the OECD, is that if you're comfortable with this, you got a problem. Because actually, you know, a lot of the way, for example, that finance ministries work, that we think, you know, how we think about budgets, how we think of the debt and the deficit has to be affected by this kind of thinking. And if not, it's just this little siloed cute area where at best we apply it to innovation policy. So how do you bring it to the center of how, you know, public policy is thought about, for example, in the European Commission, outside of just the little area of innovation to the center of the cabinet of how we're thinking about the Green Deal is central. And this is really where I want to begin, that this whole conversation that we're having with you guys today, with our Moin network, um, is you know, a fantastic conversation. It's about the direction of growth. And the concept about growth, not just having a rate, but a direction is very much out there. We don't really have to push that point through. You know, ever since the financial crisis, it's been widely, you know, understood that we can't have growth for growth's sake. There's plenty of growth just before the crisis. It was just the wrong kind of growth. So how do we get growth that's more inclusive, more sustainable, less financialized, more investment and innovation driven, but especially that really reaches goals, right? That's goal oriented. Uh, we have the sustainable development goals since 2015. They've been agreed on by every country that is part of the United Nations. And so, you know, what does that actually mean to walk the talk of sustainability in such a way that is really at the center of both how, you know, organizations are governed and both public and private, but especially how they work together. This is really, I think, the challenge. And also, you know, we don't have to push through this need to also create change in business and within government also, because within the business community itself, and those of you who go to Davos now and then will know this, there's all this talk about stakeholder value, right? That business has sort of lost its way, went too much towards short-termism, maximizing, you know, share prices. This idea that already was, you know, written about two years ago in this famous letter that went viral by Larry Fink and BlackRock, that we needed more purpose within companies, investing more widely back into, you know, workers, communities, the planet, and, you know, really a message that was then repeated in terms of the need for long-termism by the Business Roundtable a year ago in a famous letter they wrote in the New York Times. So, you know, definitely a lot of talk, SDGs, ESGs, you know, are we getting any closer to actually changing our capitalist system? And I think the answer is to a large extent, sort of, <laughs> uh, but where, where we come into the picture is that it's not gonna change actually, unless we have a fundamentally new framework for how we work together. So back to the ESG point, that's all about purpose within companies. We need to bring purpose to the center of how the system itself operates. And that's very much the key point about missions. No mission will ever be done with either just a public or private actor. It's very much about working together, but what does that mean? And you know, starting with this point that this isn't just about fixing things when they go wrong, but actually creating it is very important, especially when we look at specific policies. Because a mission-oriented innovation policy will have to then justify 
you know, different types of innovation investments, not just as fixing, say, a positive externality problem, right? You know, basic research, it creates great spillovers. That's why you have few, uh, uh, you know, you, you, we don't have enough businesses investing in it. So the private, the public sector corrects for that. That, that justification for public investment and innovation is not a good one. You're just filling the gap of something that someone else is not doing. So what does it mean to have an objective problem kind of oriented innovation system? You're gonna to have to go beyond just fixing the public good problem. Similarly, the kind of financing maybe the SMEs will require in order to be part of a dynamic innovation ecosystem, framing it as just fixing, again, an asymmetric information problem. Yes, we do have asymmetric information, but we can't just patch our way, right, to building a better system. And, you know, part of how I kind of theatrically talked about this in one of my first uh, TED Talks with this great designed uh, <laughs> a slide that... Uh, that someone did for me was saying, you know, we have to also change literally the storytelling that we have about what public policy is for. So if we continue to pretend that all the color, literally the color, the creativity, the dynamism, the value creation is done in business and the policy bit is about de-risking the risk takers, enabling, facilitating, you know, all these words that aren't actually negative, but just kind of boring, that's part of the problem. So you're not de-risking, right? The policymaker is not de-risking Zuckerberg or the Elon Musks of the world, but actually sharing risks. And if you start talking about it that way, sharing risks and welcoming uncertainty, you also start thinking about the follow-up questions like, oh, if we're sharing risk, how do we share the rewards? Whereas if one is kind of boring and de-risking the other, again, it sets it up already in very problematic ways. And also all the investments we all know we require in our systems of innovation, whether it's the infrastructure, the education, the research and development uh, system, framing it as just kind of the basics, which, you know, through kind of leveling the playing field kind of investments, again, doesn't capture the real ambition behind it. And this is a, a wonderful quote I always put up from The Economist because it really, it really captures the, this problematic narrative. And I think Moyne and, and IAPP are just as much about the narrative, new framings and practices um, you know, that are all part of this new storytelling. So the idea that somehow all the revolutionary stuff is in business and, you know, the government's there just to fix the basics, that's, that's very much what we're trying to debunk. The next slide, apologies, is a bit self-promotional, but just to say that for me, at least, the mission stuff has been kind of a slow uh, accumulation of understanding, at least for myself, you know, this notion of the entrepreneurial state being required to actually be an investor of first resort, not just the lender of last resort, and all the different institutions that are required across the innovation chain was very much at the heart of this concept of the entrepreneurial state I wrote about a decade ago. But then I started thinking a lot about how that had to be underpinned by a new approach to talking about value and wealth creation. Um, and that really meant going to the heart of economic theory, how we talk about the creation of value in economics and making sure that we were debunking that along the way. And again, the kind of recent work on missions, which uh, this whole Moy network is about, I've been trying to more recently really think that through also uh, very holistically, which is what does it mean to have, again, uh, an outcomes oriented, mission oriented approach to policymaking itself, not siloed within any one bit of it, whether it's industrial strategy or innovation. And what does that mean for, you know, again, the big economic questions, as well as the very practical, the purpose led um, approaches. So, um, you know, the background issue is that this whole idea of market shaping, it's not just what we think should happen, it's what has happened. So, you know, the big innovations that occurred from the early uh, uh, capitalist era actually could not have come about without both public and private. But if you actually look at the public interventions, they were really distributed across the whole innovation chain, the value chain, as much on the supply side as on the demand side, and often also really housed within certain types of entities, whether it was in some cases, innovation agencies, public banks, procurement agencies, and really better understanding what kind of drives some of the organizational dynamic behind those organizations was very much the starting point. Um, and you know, the iPhone story, which was the uh, kind of entrepreneurial state theatrical part was very much about saying, look, you know, there's two big points here. We wouldn't have any of the smart technology in our phones without public money. But on top of that, there was particular organizations, right? So internet, GPS, touchscreen, Siri, they came about through uh, particular organizations like DARPA funding the internet. And what do we know about that? You know, and yes, that's talked about sometimes in the case study kind of way, but we don't really even embed it in any of our economic models. 
if we know that this kind of problem oriented culture and you know willingness to take risks and to have a portfolio approach all that kind of darpa story is important do we do we even have measures of understanding when it exists when it doesn't and especially what does it look like going forwards in terms of sharing the experiences of such organizations sharing the experiences of stepping outside of this pure just kind of market fixing box um, and in fact, if you look at just the websites, right, like I'm not talking about hardcore economics here, of many of the organizations that one can think and talk about as mission oriented, you don't see any of that boring language when they're talking about themselves, right? It's very much that co-creation language affecting and creating new landscapes, new markets, not just fixing existing ones. And yet again, how do we codify that in terms of, you know, our ability to talk about economic growth and to steer economic growth? And in, in, in fostering that kind of a, a market shaping and mission orientedness within these public actors, which we know have been so important. Um, and so a lot of the work we've done in the Institute has been about saying, look, this is, you know, this problematic language uh, is part of the problem. What is the new language that we actually require? So if it's not fixing, is it co-creating and co-shaping? What does that look like as a rigorous framework to then also measure whether you've succeeded or not? If it's not de-risking, what does it mean to welcome uncertainty and share risks and rewards? If it's not leveling, what does it mean to tilt the direction of growth, not by putting all your eggs in one basket, but really choosing that direction and then creating portfolios that really pick the willing, as one could argue. What does it mean for the kind of internal capabilities and capacities that you need? Because we've seen so much outsourcing of that capacity uh, globally. And again, this issue of a uh, metrics. And so the missions approach really kind of begins with that challenge of, hey, let's you know talk differently and let's have a different approach that can really be inspired in some ways by one of the most challenging uh, missions we've ever accomplished, which was the moon landing. And this isn't about copy and pasting, you know, what happened to go to the moon, because we all know that that was, you know, I don't want to say purely technological, but very different from the kind of SDG related um, missions. But it is important to pause a minute and to just admit that this was extremely hard. It required a huge amount of private sector, not just public sector, right? I've been going on about public, but everyone knows the, the moon landing was in fact very much a public mission, but there was lots of private sector effort. And what was interesting is how they worked together, literally how the procurement policy was designed, for example, by NASA to crowd in all sorts of different efforts, but also the incredible cross-sectoral uh, uh, amount of work that you know ha had to be done. It wasn't just aeronautics, lots of, innovation and investment in materials, electronics, um, software uh, uh, was part of that story. And so the idea is, you know, start today, not with the Cold War, uh, you know, idea, but these SDGs, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the 169 targets beneath them, what would it look like to have this kind of outcomes oriented, really bold and ambitious strategy, which, you know, underlying each of the SDGs but also nesting it really within local context. So the missions themselves are co-created and decided upon by the different types of participants involved, especially with some of our work on cities, we've experienced what that means, say, to bring citizen assemblies to the table. But you know, starting with a challenge, transforming it into a mission that requires lots of different sectors, and then redesigning the tools on the ground to foster that bottom-up experimentation. Um, these are just some examples that I wrote about in this report. This was the kind of key report that uh, launched some of this mission thinking in Europe. It became um, sort of law, I guess you could say, because the parliament and the council voted on it. And in arguing for it, um, we used two examples, actually several examples uh, to show what it might look like. So if you take the climate change, SDG 14, transforming that into a very clear mission around carbon neutrality, by definition would require, you know, innovation, not just in renewable energy, but in, in the real estate, construction, mobility, social sectors, and all those different types of projects that would be crowded in. But they wouldn't happen on their own. There would have to be, again, that, that ability to catalyze and create additionality bottom up to co-create different solutions for these missions needs to be really embedded in the design of the tools themselves. Um, you know, what is a mission? In the report, we talked about five key criteria. Again, that kind of bold, inspirational uh, uh, mission, which then does foster new thinking in terms of where future opportunities lie, but they have to be really clear, directed, and targeted, be cross-disciplinary. This is, I think, very important for academia to remember it's not just about the sciences, the hard sciences. You need humanities and social sciences helping to really also think about 
uh, you know, inspirational uh, uh, ways also to um, engage with citizens um, and cross actor, public, private, third sector. But this point about doing all this in such a way that really then drives multiple bottom up solutions is, is really the design question. Um, how to implement missions. This was a second report that we wrote very much beginning with this question of who decides and what does it mean to foster citizen engagement, but also in terms of the financing, because any pot of money won't necessarily be enough. How do you really leverage and create a multiplier effect uh, by thinking through that kind of financing and crowding in uh, issues? This is very important for Europe where the actual innovation budget is not that high still uh, relative to GDP. So if you have a mission oriented approach, really thinking through the design of the tools to then crowd in other types of finance, that issues around flexibility, adaptability, accountability, and really focusing a lot on this issue of, of, of public sector capabilities that are required. The work we did with the UK government was very much around the industrial strategy side of things. Up until then, they had a, a list of sectors. They were thinking about uh, aeronautics, um, automotive, life sciences, creative industries, and financial services. And we said, stop thinking about random lists of sectors think about your key challenges and then we help set up this or we organized a mission oriented a commission for the industrial strategy that helped to transform some of these broad challenges like the future of mobility into um, uh, uh, missions. So this is the example that we worked with and it was very interesting when we added the word universally accessible travel to the uh, future mobility mission by definition that required quite a bit of a bottom up innovation in the area of disabilities, for example. Uh, but this was work done for two years with the government. We've also more recently been working at a very local level with Camden, part of London, where our own university is based, but which also sits on the land on top of which uh, Google and Facebook rent out space. Uh, so they also are thinking about the tools like wealth funds and what would that look like for Camden. But this is an interesting one because the carbon neutrality mission for this particular part of London is gonna be focused on 250 housing estates um, so social housing throughout uh, uh, London and actually involving citizens very much in that process of, you know, being able also to have metrics that they themselves can monitor over time in terms of whether their own lives are, are improving or not. Um, we worked with uh, financial actors. So in Scotland, uh, they were interested in setting up a public bank. We helped them do that and made sure that within the design of the bank itself, it was focused on some of Scotland's own um, ways that they've been thinking about the SDGs at the macroeconomic level. But in our heads, we were really also very wary of the fact that there are plenty of public banks out there, which unfortunately often become handout machines. I'm from Italy and our own public bank, Casa Depositi e Presiti, hasn't been as ambitious and catalytic. It could have been in the past because it didn't necessarily have goals and didn't necessarily see itself as being, again, that investor first resort that could put some conditionalities, for example, in place with the loans themselves. And so by having uh, a goal oriented bank, that means that the way that the public loans are being handed out can also create some conditionalities that those receiving those loans help steer the area into a new direction. This is what happened, for example, in Germany where the KFW put some conditions attached to the loan it gave to the steel sector in recent years, this was uh, three years ago. Um, and so the repurpose, reuse, recycle innovations that steel in Germany had to uh, implement uh, weren't because they went to Davos and talked about purpose. It was because they had to in order just to access that loan from that mission oriented bank. Um, and we actually just last week with Olga, who I think is also on the call, uh, wrote a report for the European Investment Bank uh, funded by them on what it would, would it look like to transform the EIB's uh, loan generation system if it really is going to be a climate bank and a bank that's oriented around the circular economy. It's, it's not going to be status quo thinking. The work in Italy has been interesting because as you know, the European recovery scheme right now, unlike after the financial crisis, is not conditional on austerity, you know, countries lowering their deficits, but actually investments being made around climate and digitalization. And so one of the, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to come up with strategies. It's not so easy then to implement them. So a lot of the work we've been doing with Italy recently has been looking both at you know, what might you know, missions be at, at the high level in Italy, but especially what is the capacity that's required on the ground for changes, for example, in the way that public administration itself um, has been operating. And so um, really kind of getting some examples like the strategic use of uh, public procurement, but also debates about what is public value within the Italian public service, 
um, the ways to use state-owned enterprises in a more dynamic way than they have been used in the past. Uh, these are all uh, uh, issues that we are working with with the Italian government. Um, and we actually just wrote a report, I think two weeks ago uh, for the UK government around this issue of evaluation. And a lot of that was on the back of some work we did in a paper called the Economics of Change, which might be passed out to you as, a, as a resources, where we looked at, again, what is the different evaluation techniques that you would need if you're you know, implementing a market shaping approach. So not cost benefit analysis and net present value, but more dynamic types of metrics that actually capture, for example, the very the uh, dynamic spillovers that happen along the way, right? In the same way that software benefited immensely along the way, getting to the moon, that's true actually of most missions, and yet we don't really know how to capture that. Let me just finish because I think time's up. Um, this, this approach of roots, organizations, assessment, risks and rewards that uh, where I talked about, if you want, there's a background paper on that from 2016, but really that last point of risks and rewards, I think is, is often the, uh, the, uh, the most difficult bit. It requires a lot of courage. And you know, this really is about, again, changing the narrative. So if you're sharing risks, what does it look like to share the rewards? What does it look like to talk very openly about how we govern the innovation system in the public interest and not just private profit in terms of the implications for IPR, intellectual property rights, or prices. That's the case for health innovation, which is obviously often publicly financed, but then the prices don't reflect that. Or conditions attached, as I already mentioned, the conditionality, for example, of reinvesting profits back into the system instead of siphoning them out. That notion of purpose in the beginning could actually be embedded within um, the contracts themselves. And under this current moment of COVID recovery schemes, which as you'll know, globally, you know, it's a huge amount of money, two trillion in the US, two trillion in Europe and so on, one trillion in Japan, it is actually a very interesting moment to bring these notions of public value, for example, into how we produce vaccines together. What does it mean again for patent pools and collective intelligence instead of just private profits, but also the conditionalities. You'll know that in France, for example, both Renault and Air France were forced to commit to lowering their carbon emissions as part of their own recovery funds received or in Denmark, uh, they had a very specific point about you can't use tax havens <laughs> if you're going to get recovery uh, funds from us. So this is the moment, I think, to be bringing this missions concept into a more uncomfortable ground than it has been when it was just siloed in innovation policy, because we have to bring it to the center of how public and private work together. And, and, and the way we talk about conditionalities is interesting, I think, as an example of that. And sometimes it also requires new institutions, like in Barcelona in Spain, the mayor Ada Colau, you know, brought in hackers into the city government precisely into having a much more proactive governance of the data to benefit the public purpose. So public transport, for example, instead of always being intermediated by say the big tech companies. So that's just a really interesting experimental ground that people like Francesca Bria, who's part of Moin has, you know, really led on. And we also work closely with some parts of the world that actually have experience and a history of a stakeholder value approach because they have cooperatives. Right, so the Mondragon region of Spain, where some of us are working with the local government, you know, 87,000 workers in the Mondragon cooperative, that whole region actually has a history and experience of engaging different value creation uh, actors in negotiating the future. And so what does it look like to bring the cooperative model outside just of corporate governance into a regional transition for how workers, capital, government, academics kind of work together. And this is a very interesting, um, uh, thanks. Sorry, I went way too long. So I will finish just with saying this is more important than ever in the COVID moment, but we're really thrilled to be working with many of you. I think uh, one thing Rowan didn't mention is that with some of you, we've actually been doing deep dives, which means, you know, working with you over a two year period into the, the that kind of organizational change that has to uh, be confronted in terms of, again, what does it mean for budgets, for procurement and for partnerships. And we're very keen to extend some of these deep dives. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mariana. Now there've been some active um, questions in the in the um, in the chat while you were going. You definitely stimulated a lot of um, a lot of interest. And I think um, I would just uh, follow up with what Mariana said there in terms of. Uh, do go to the Moin website uh, or the IOPP website to go and look at some of the um, insights that are coming from these deep dives and they span the whole world looking at work in Latin America, looking at work in Italy and South Africa um, and increasingly um, work in Asia as well. So there's a 
there's a, a lot of really interesting insights that we're working on and we would love to to hear more about the work that you do. So to start bridging that gap, I'm going to um, pull out some of the questions and I ask you to unmute and then um, speak to your question. I'm going to start actually with Anir Chowdhury. And I think you're in Bangladesh, Anir, is that correct? You had a great question. Um, I'll read it if you if, if I can't see you at some point, but. Hi, hi Rowan, how are you? Great, thanks, how are you? I'm doing well, can you hear me? Yes, but we can hear you fine. Do you want to, to say your question as opposed to me reading it out for you? Uh, sure, I think, uh, Mariana, thank you. That was a, an excellent presentation, uh, very informative, insightful. Uh, structure of government, and I work uh, within the structure of Bangladeshi government, uh, which is probably uh, in general, uh, much more uh, rigid than many other governments around the world. But at the same time, in the last uh, 10, 12 years, we have tried to become uh, more and more open and agile. And we're seeing many uh, benefits of that. And we've tried to, there is this digital Bangladesh agenda that we coined about 13 years ago. And that has brought together a lot of mission-oriented uh, initiatives uh, so around, around digitization, transformation within the government, simplification of service delivery. But what we have seen in general is that the structure in, uh, within the government, any incentive structure, HR structure, procurement process, uh, is anti-collaboration. So it, it's, 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 it's actually, people are incentivized to maintain the silo. It's, they're disincentivized, disincentivized to actually break silo and work together across, uh, across departments. So if, if collaboration is the underpinning, is the foundation of mission-oriented approach, then what is the reform that we have to uh, take into account to move towards mission-oriented approach for innovation? It's a great question. And, you know, I think part of it is the position of where the missions sit. So that's why I actually wrote an article for the Financial Times, I think it was August 9th, arguing that Europe had to take the missions out of just the innovation box and put it at the center of the economic growth box, which meant that ECFIN, you know, DG ECFIN, the finance ministries needed to talk about this stuff just as much as the innovation ministries, but also that, you know, the question of what does it mean for the Green Deal? And so the first thing is literally, where do they sit? And it's too easy to make them sit in these little siloed, you know, places like Ministry of the Environment or Innovation. And I do think bringing them to the center is key and, and bringing them to literally how we think about the economy. Um, so, so I spent quite a bit of time in the presentation talking about that we have the wrong growth models and, you know, our, our econometric models don't include any of this for a reason that unless we, you know, confront this issue of directionality of growth, um, and do so in such a way with tools and in our models themselves, the, the variables <laughs> that do or do not have that kind of directional element, then again, we're going to continue to have the old economic models and at best have funky little policies on the side, but they don't speak one to the other. The experience, I mean, just on a more practical level, uh, Mike Bracken, who I don't know if he'll be taking part of the this Moin uh, boot camp, but he was leading government digital services for the UK government. And it was very interesting the experience they had based on what you just said, because he saw their role as setting up gov.uk precisely to create a platform so all the different departments could work together in a much more easy way also, right? So it's not just public private, it's public public. How do you get different parts of public administration to really collaborate and to think together? And he thought, hey, having actually a common web platform will help that also. Instead, you know, it wasn't exactly uh, uh, welcomed with open arms. Each department continued to kind of work in their siloed approach, even though in theory they had this new technology that could have actually, you know, it's, it's, it's not technocentric, but it, it was also fostered in order to help make that happen easier, but wasn't <laughs> done. Um, and in fact, in some ways, I think the reason why a lot of the early GDS people ended up resigning from GDS was they were like, hold on, we weren't here just to create a website. We were here to change how government actually works um, and to really foster that you know, intergovernmental uh, collaboration. So I think unless one talks about that as openly as you just did, it doesn't happen. And so had the GDS activity from the beginning been uh, you know, really explicit that we're doing this because we can't have proper government without having you know, the different departments uh, uh, you know, on the same platform, but also thinking, you know, using the platform to foster more collaboration. Um, you know, it wasn't useful just to have that in their own heads and not say it explicitly. But the public-private collaboration bit, 
I mean, my view is we don't have metrics for that. So we talk about ESG, but we don't have the equivalent for is the partnership symbiotic, mutualistic or parasitic. And in the health sector, which I know a lot about, we have a very problematic way for setting up public private partnerships. And the PFI schemes, you know, the private financing initiatives in the health sector in the UK were extremely problematic. But it's one thing to critique it, it's, it's another thing to build a better partnership. And I do think we need to take as seriously the, the metrics issue around the partnership, just like a biologist would never let you get away with the word ecosystem without saying, is it predator prey? <laughs> is it some, you know, we need in the innovation community also to think through what does it look like to have a, a much more functional and not dysfunctional partnership. Great. So, um, Second follow-up question, is that possible, Ron, if you allow? Uh, we actually, we're running a little bit over time and we have so many questions, but do put it into the, 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 um, the chat and I will make sure that we come back to it. Because I want to go to Andre Cordiero in Brazil, um, who had also asked a question about risk. And I'm reckoning that we're not going to be able to get through all of the questions that have come through, but I will endeavor to ensure that we follow up with them. But um, Andre, Andre, do you want to, to chime in with your question? Hello, uh, are you listening to me? Yes. First and foremost, I would like to apologize for some typos. I am very, <laughs> I, I am a little bit nervous. First time participating in this kind of event, so apologize. Uh, I, I can try, okay, because uh, I work with people management, so I've been working for a long time, and I am really great, really, really grateful to see people with economic backgrounds questioning these assumptions, this narrative that everything good comes from one side, everything bad comes from the other. So to work within this environment is very challenging because I would like to know if you could please share a bit about how can we help the public agents, especially decision makers, managers, people that supposedly are in power because they are all the time feeling the weight of how they will be evaluated in the end. Can they really take risks? Really? We, we really incentive this or we punish this? I mean, I, I believe I'm talking more about Brazil, this is my source, but I've been seeing academic works all around the world speaking about this. So I'd like to, to please uh, share a little bit of light of how can we help these guys transform how can we help change the behavior and eventually the perception that society have regarding us that and COVID is here to, to kind of uh, explode these matters for us, please. Um, I know Cheryl Martin is here. I, I got a nice little private chat from her and, and I must say Cheryl's taught me a lot about this. Cheryl used to um, run ARPA-E, which is the you know, sister of DARPA, but in the Department of Energy. And when I invited her to give a talk, I think it was back in 2014, Cheryl, around mission-oriented finance, I was still at Sussex at the time, I asked you that exact question um, in one of our panels. I said, Cheryl, you run ARPA-E and you're obviously taking huge risks. How do you do that, given that you're a public agency and you know, public service isn't supposed to be a risk-taking uh, service, but a stabilizing, you know? And I remember she said, you know, we actually measure our success in ARPA-E by how much risk we were willing to take, but also how much economy-wide impact our successes have. So both being really bold and you know, going after things like battery storage, which isn't just a gadget, it has you know, the potential to really transform a system, but recognizing that along the way, you're gonna screw up quite a lot <laughs> is, is extremely important. And what you're saying, Andre, is true in so many countries that you have you know, venture capitalists being able to boast that, yeah, we you know, failed, but then big success, you know, Genentech, big success for Kleiner Perkins, before that, they had all sorts of failures, but that's also because they are able to reap the rewards from the successes, right? So what does it mean to reap the rewards from the successes to counter also the, the failures along the way? That's not, that's not just a monetary issue. That's, you know, that's also that issue of conditionality. How do you structure a system? So when you're experimenting and, and, and you know, learning and the trial and error that's occurring, you really are learning from that failure. That itself is, is part of your reward. But if you're not investing in-house in the capability to learn, if you're not a learning organization, because you haven't framed the civil service and public organizations as learning organizations, you might not even be making those investments that you require for the trial and error. So if you are failing, you're not actually learning from it. So I think, I think there's three different issues. One is the narrative about value that I've you know, been going on about for quite a bit of years. 
if you admit that you're a value creating public organization, of course, you're going to have to fail. If you pretend you're just market fixing, it's not obvious why you would have to fail. So the first thing is the narrative, right? The co-creating, just like the private sector knows it has to, you know, take risks and be bold if it's creating something. That's the narrative story. But also structuring the portfolio in such a way, whether it's through equity retention, whether it's how you govern the IPR that I mentioned before, whether it's conditionality on the reinvestment or, the, um, or on the prices, for example, if we're talking about certain types of, of areas like energy or medicines, um, that itself, how you govern that process, makes sure that even though you're taking risks, the successes have impact in the sense that the process itself is structured in such a way that has these you know, important uh, you know, spillovers for the public sector. I mean, the obvious place where it doesn't work, as I mentioned, is IPR, where you know, um, how we've set it up actually doesn't even give the public sector its reward at the end of the patent, because we've allowed the patents to be so upstream, so wide, so strong, that you actually don't even get diffusion once the patent is over because we, we've really screwed up the process in the first place. And so that's why this whole notion of governing in the public interest is so important, because it's not just about whether the mission itself succeeds, like, you know, did you get to the moon or not, but did you structure the process that could really foster a lot of these spillovers along the way? And so the learning also from the mistakes made. I'm on mute. Excellent. Thank you so much, you. Mariana, for your for your time. We're not going to have time to go to all of the questions, but what we will do is endeavour to come back with to to you all with some uh, insights gathered from this session. We also have um, a, a reflective session with Mariana, which you're very welcome to sign up to on the 15th of December, where she will be having an intimate conversation or fireside chat with some of the people we've been doing deep dives with. So with Georgia Gould um, from the um, from Camden Council that she referred to, and also from from some of our, our colleagues in Italy and in South Africa. So please do, I will um, uh, post a, a link to that. Please do sign up for that if you'd like to carry on this conversation, which I know we could carry on all day. I, I always enjoy these sessions so much. Um, but thank you so much, Mariana, for, for joining us for this session. I know you have four international <laughs> sessions today. Um, so it's been, it's been really fabulous to, to have you um, and I apologize to those who didn't have the opportunity to get your question in, but um, we will move on to the next part of the agenda and then come back to some of the insights that Mariana had spoken about in the breakout groups later. So I'll just, I'll, I will log my reaction and, and give you a virtual round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rowan, and thank you so much, Mariana. Uh, UCL and I have, have done a fantastic job in kind of raising the importance of missions uh, for Europe and all around the world, because we have actually problems to solve that need uh, solutions. So these are things that do not wait. We are potentially the last generation to have any impact in climate change in terms of what it means to live on the planet Earth. So we are kind of... Uh, we have many, many challenges that actually need mission-oriented approaches and ways of doing things. And we at the observatory have been also starting to think about uh, ways to make uh, mission operational, operational and accessible. So what, what type of agreements or framing of missions that you actually need to uh, do to make missions uh, possible so that missions themselves start to have a logic onto themselves that will start to change the infrastructure of government uh, uh, in its entirety based on the mission logic. Uh, because missions do not happen on their own. They need solid and contextually aware methodology on how to actually make it happen. So one of the pictures and the canvases that you see is something that we tested out in Estonia by the highest level of leadership uh, to define and frame missions and to start thinking about if we're going to make this vision work and we are going to play to fend win so kind of having a mindset of uh, no uh, possible to lose to actually uh, get to solve the problem and get uh, loving the problem in its entirety, then how do we have to actually structure the way we work in a different way to get it done in its entirety as well? And this is also something that you need to be aware of, that you need uh, both the kind of the top heavy uh, actions from mission-oriented change, but you also need the missions to be creative and, uh, and in a way simple enough and clear enough that it, they speak to your partners because you also want to crowd in adaptive action, anticipatory action from your partners in its entirety. 
you also need to think about the innovation portfolios and how do you manage the portfolio of innovations that will actually allow you to have to kind of work in a mission oriented way and get to the results in practice. So how do you manage those portfolios connected to the missions themselves? And not last but not least about what type of leadership uh, you need to have in place because leaders also are emerged in the public sector from the perspective of kind of the rational needs, the needs that they need to be uh, whispering to ministers, uh, looking at opportunities or fixing day-to-day -day challenges. So how to also kind of flip uh, the kind of the mission mindset on within leaders or actually look at leaders or capacities within the public sector to actually get the, the missions done or get to that kind of mission logic within the public sector itself. So all of these are questions that we at the observatory are working on and our great colleague in the director of science, technology and innovation, Philippe Rou, is also doing substantive research about uh, what type of missions uh, have you know, emerged so far and what type of challenges are there uh, to begin with. So Philippe, I'm going to give the floor over to you. Thank you very much, Pirette, and thank you all at OPSI and uh, UCL, Mariana and uh, her team, to give me that opportunity to present some of the work we do at OECD, at OECD STI, Science, Technology and Innovation Directorate uh, on mission-oriented policy. Uh, what I will present today is uh, a very a snapshot. Uh, I will over, over some of the results of a two-year project uh, that we've done under the authority of the Committee on for Science and Technology uh, Policy. What basically what we've been doing is um, to go, doing a deep dive into some of the policy landscapes of uh, several countries to understand, to identify mission-oriented policy and try to understand better their challenges, their opportunities, their different forms, really get into the, uh, the practical uh, matters of mission-oriented policy. And to do that, of course, we first needed a definition so we heard about definition, but here we have tried to formalize that, package that into some kind of uh, functional and effective definition that you will see is very much uh, compatible with everything you've heard so far uh, during this uh, workshop. So we define mission-oriented policy as a coordinated package of research and innovation policy measures, so policy and regulatory measures. So this is not a fragmented measure that uh, we usually find when we obey to this uh, market fixing uh, framework. Here, it's really a, a bundle of uh, uh, policy and regulatory measures. And of course, as we said uh, today, they aim to address societal challenges, uh, SDGs or other forms of formalization of uh, uh, societal challenges. They span several stages of the innovation cycle uh, from uh, upstream from uh, research uh, downstream to a demonstration and even market launch. They use different instruments, supply side and demand side, top down and bottom up. They cross different policy fields, but also disciplines and sectors. And all that is targeted in a very clear, uh, ambitious and concrete goals to be achieved in a defined time frame. And if you try to open up a little bit more this black box of mission oriented policy, we see that we have three main dimensions, strategic orientation, policy coordination and policy implementation. And you see that this definition that I've just uh, mentioned before, just presented before, is some kind of uh, ideal type. When you look into uh, through the policy landscapes of country, you see that basically no policy measures, no policy, mission-oriented policy measures ready uh, tick all boxes. If you can go back one, I, I know you're trying to <laughs> hurry me up, but if you go, so what we've done is that we, we elaborated a bit more on this, uh, uh, on this definition. And what we came up with is what we call the mission oriented policy functional specification, where you see the list of requirements along those three dimensions that we would expect. Again, this is, we used a very much Weberian approach, you know, in terms of ideal type. And what we have, this is the core, and we have what we see in the countries are uh, different policy initiatives that come closer or further from that definition along those three dimensions. Thank you. Now we can get to the... Uh, and uh, so uh, we have also defined four, maybe we have tried to do some taxonomy typology of uh, mission-oriented policy. We came up with four main types of uh, policy, mission-oriented policy initiatives. First, we have this uh, top level overarching mission-oriented strategic framework like the uh, uh, H in, in Germany, uh, the high-tech strategy 2025, the top, se the top sectors, mission-driven top sectors in, in Netherlands. Then we have more those uh, challenge-based approach that are more implemented at the level of uh, agencies, sometimes ministry, which are much more focused on mainly more technical challenge, technological challenge. 
We have those thematic mission-oriented programs that really build on a long tradition of thematic programs that you can find everywhere, but they try to improve them in terms of coordination, strategic orientation, and implementation. And then you have a specific type, which you could say is, is a, a subcategory of maybe the, the two uh, first one, which we call the delegated mission programs, where he, it's very specific. They really delegate the authority of creating the missions to stakeholders. This is something that we would find to some degree in main mission-oriented policy, but here you have specific programs, especially in Sweden and in Finland, I'm in Scandinavian country at large, where really uh, there is a clear delegation of the authority of the, of the and it's really a, a co-creation of the agenda. And we find that they have very, those four types are very different types of challenges. Uh, the overarching of uh, the overarching type, well, they are confronted with problem of focus and integration and they risk some kind of inflame, inflation and dilution of missions in the sense that they, they are very broad and compassing initiatives. You have to enlist a lot of stakeholders and the more you enlist stakeholders, the more you risk diluting the mission or creating more missions. There is here one of the many tensions of mission orientation, and of course, transaction costs. If you talk, if you if you re look at the uh, Dutch top sector policy, you will see that they try to to mix different types of governance, mission governance, sectoral governance, and that creates a lot of committees and a lot of transaction costs. Uh, then, challenge-based program here, the main, and we are just a. Uh, uh, Present that one. The main, uh, the main issue is the articulation between the supply push and the demand side instruments. I know this is the theory in mission that you are trying to do that, but in practice, you need to share information. You need to make compatible different measures that are hardly sometimes very hard on an administrative uh, uh, matter. Sometimes dimension. Sometimes it's very very complicated. One key issue also with these more challenge-based programs is really that you come up with mainly local solution, very specific solutions. It's more like a project or sometimes a program. But then if you really want to have a transformational effect, then you need scale up and you need diffusion. And this is where some countries, as we will see, uh, have a problem now and are stuck at that level and need to elevate the, uh, the mission framework to a uh, to the upper level of policy making if you really want to have a, 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 an impact. Thank you, uh, Pierrette, for the next one. Now, if we uh, look uh, throughout the three dimensions that I mentioned before, and we, we, I try to summarize here some of the challenges that we have identified uh, on strategic orientation. First, as we all know, and that has been well uh, presented by, by Mariana, uh, the idea is that with mission, you pick problems, not solutions. This is true. But this is true only to the extent that the, the, the problems that you, that you are uh, looking at are searching for technological uh, and scientific solutions. That means that we haven't found many mission-oriented policy that really open up also to social, uh, societal solutions that would require changing consumption behavior, production behaviors. Here, it's less, uh, there are some cases, and again, some, some in Sweden, some of the uh, experiences uh, that are there are part of that, but there are not that many. Mainly, they remain in the technological and scientific, uh, uh, in the realm of scientific and technological solutions for the good reason that they are mainly, right now, up to that stage, many of those mission-oriented policy are uh, under the authority of STI, Science, Technology, and Innovation Authorities. So what they are looking for is scientific so and technological solutions. Here, this is a very strong tension and a very important point. Uh, very few initiatives have set the real missions. You remember those five criteria, criteria that Mariana presented? Well, not many of them uh, have that. Uh, main, it's mainly mission areas. Some of them have no deadline and no timeline, or there are no clear targets. Some of them really look like uh, mission washing in the sense that it's uh, industrial targeting put into some kind of uh, mission robe. So uh, you sometimes it's not that clear. Something also very important in strategic orientation is the fact that often the mission creation uh, moment is presented as a one-off stage where you pre you create the mission and then you try to achieve it. That's not the way it works. If you look really 
kind of very precisely at some of those mission-oriented policy, what you see is a very long and sequential process. So those five criteria that Mariana presented are in fact not met at the same time. And very often the real mission, you get it where at the end of, of this spectrum of this process when it comes to projects. So it's very much bottom-up steer. It's not like you have those top-down. There are, that exists. You will find that in Japan, the moonshot, they have set those uh, seven goals, moonshot goals with clear targets and timelines, and then they will try to do it. But most of the time, this is not how it happens. Most of the time, it's very left to projects in the end to determine the targets and to determine what can be, what is really, uh, what we are really aiming to do. In terms of governance, many elaborated, multi-level, what we call nested, cross-ministerial, cross-agency governance structure that is great, that is really a, a a very important added value of mission-oriented policy, but still we don't know much about what is really happening into all those committees. At OECD, we always some we often recommend to create a new committee. You know that uh, we we add governance layers, but it, it doesn't solve all the problems. When you look into those committees, you see that there are st strong tensions, power conflicts, and we would need to look a bit more into that. Uh, then um, still now policy implementation. When we look at evaluation of mission-oriented policy, you, I'm sure you have read very nice article saying that uh, systemic policy needs systemic evaluation. Well, this is not what happens right now. We are not there. I'm not saying that this is not happen that that won't happen, but that hasn't happened. And for the moment, mission-oriented policy are very much relying on the traditional. Uh, system, uh, evaluation tools, and there is limited reflexivity on pilot experiments, and that hinders mission orientation scale up. Most of these uh, uh, mission oriented policy are still pilots, and now we're coming to a very, very important pivotal moment where we have countries have to decide whether they get to the next stage if they really want to that this uh, Mayana uh, framework and agenda really uh, takes place. And here you can see, and I thank you very much uh, for your attention, and you can see. Uh, where you can find more on this project. Thank you very much. Sorry if I've been a bit longer. Thank you, Pirette. Back to you. Thank you, Philip. Uh, there's a lot of work that uh, the team in SCI has been doing in analyzing these different cases. So do log on to the MOIP online toolkit platform that you can see the link here. Uh, maybe also our uh, um, elves in the background can share the link in the chat. Uh, but of course, you're going to get the slides from the workshop as well. So you can get the links afterwards as well. And of course, looking forward to the final report of Philip's work at the beginning of next year. So put it on your reading list for 2021. Uh, for now, I'm going to also uh, kind of ask from you about the, which uh, mission challenges have most uh, resonated with you. So you've talked, uh, you've heard uh, Mariana talk a little bit about kind of what is challenging, why institutions or what is standing in the way of missions. You've talked to Philip. Uh, we've heard Philip talking about quite a lot about uh, uh, what his analysis and his team analysis have shown in terms of mission challenges. But uh, what are the challenges that in your practice are, are most resonating with you? So I'm asking again for you to log on to the WooClap site. So it's still www.wooclap.com slash missions2020 and you can log in your vote. So just type in the in the vote and uh, and we shall see creating ecosystems. So we have one, one coming forward, uh, silos, uh, power dynamics, ecosystems and climate crisis in its entirety. So in our practice as well, what we have seen that uh, um, people seem to be extremely busy in the public sector as well that uh, and a lot of these existing practices of how to do things in terms of procurement or timelines that we're running against uh, um, budgets that are split, split between silos or between ministries can actually break up the mission logic. So we're not able to act uh, in a timely uh, manner as well in consortia with other ministries uh, or other agencies or actors. Uh, and we cannot be also sure that while we have thought about our portfolio or our mix of actions, that we can reach those things in time. Uh, also, now we're coming in with a lot of different uh, approaches. You can also uh, put in many if, uh, if uh, you can vote several times in this round. So we are seeing uh, digital transition, transformation, creating ecosystems as one of the challenges, risk-taking behavior, 
power dynamics again, capabilities, evaluational issues, uh, stakeholder engagement, uh, government capabilities and others emerging. So quite a huge and very interesting set of different uh, challenges uh, working with ecosystems as well. Um, so we are also working together with different countries in different countries from Sweden to Latvia to others on also on how to create that ecosystem mindset. So how to create visions for ecosystems around potentially missions or future visions and how to take them into practice. So what kind of uh, structures, organizations, or even ways of acting you need to have in place to make it possible. I'm going to give you another 15 minutes to log in, uh, 15 seconds to log in your answers. And then we're going to hear about the, from the practice uh, of, uh, of mission oriented innovation. So hearing from the mouth of, pe mouth of people that have actually done it, so have lived through it in its entirety. So thank you so much for your answers. And we're going to, of course, uh, analyze and look into the, kind of the different uh, resonating challenges later on as well. I'm going to give it over to, I'm going to give it over to Rowan to introduce the different cases and uh, uh, going into the kind of uh, nitty gritty of how to actually do uh, missions in practice. Excellent, thank you. Did we skip our first cup of tea? I think that's okay. We'll have a cup of tea after this one. We've, we've got more content yet to come. And um, thank you. That was really exciting seeing that, um, that word cl cloud build into the complexity that is um, leading mission-oriented innovation. So um, I'm really looking forward to looking at that later. And one of the things to sort of remind you about today's boot camp is it's both a kind of learning exercise for you guys, but also a harvesting exercise for us to learn more about these challenges so that we can build that to the next workshop, which will be focusing much more on tools. Um, but we're gonna give you some insights into that now with a kind of a set of a suite of, um, of MOIN members who are doing this work in practice. Um, and I'm really excited because many of them have really built in this sort of experimental frameworks or the learning, learning that you need to do um, in order to, to make this more of a systemic piece of work. So building on Philippe's um, presentation there. We're gonna start with Dan Hill. So I'm gonna hand over to him. He has um, promised he's going to do 30 slides in 10 minutes. So we'll see how we go with that. Um, and Dan is my colleague at IEPP as well as being the Director of Strategic Design at Vinova, the Swedish Innovation Agency. He needs no further introduction from me. I will hand over to you, Dan. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna report from the front line, or at least the front line in Sweden anyway, which is, it was really instructive following Philippe uh, and who we talked with a bit because he outlines how diverse all of the approaches are here. And I'm gonna just show you what we've been up to in a couple of years really, uh, 18 months perhaps. And so our starting point is this quote from Madeleine Albright actually. Uh, of course, we work closely with Mariana and Rowan and all our colleagues at IAPP, but, also building on a strong tradition of looking at the need for transformation in the public sector and government and around innovation. And so she laid out very clearly in a very different US administration uh, to the one we currently have about the need to actually transform the entire approach. So next slide, please. Brett. So what we did when we started the mission work was not actually um, building on some of what Philippe was saying, not actually starting with a sort of a top-down message from above or the prime minister saying, go in this direction, let's all run there. But we started with a very open process around a couple of key areas, pilot areas, if you like, mobility and food. And we went straight to the ground because Sweden is a very localized distributed place. And so we run these kind of what we call actors workshops. These are people running local transport authorities or people from companies, big or small, people from social sector as well. Lots of public sector, actually very few academics and so-called experts. We went to the experts in everyday life, the experts trying to get things done on the ground and got them to build system maps together. So next slide, please. Out of that came a few starting points and we took immediately this kind of place-based approach. So we have these mission themes of healthy, sustainable food and healthy, sustainable mobility. But then we're looking for place-based environments, kind of system environments, because they force things to be systemic immediately. They force you to look at the context. You don't just lead with the technology. You can work with people and place very directly. Next one, please. Let me take one of those. So for instance, the street 
If you look at the street, how we currently run it on the left-hand side there, the type is very small, so forgive me. But if you put the traffic department in charge of the street, you get traffic, basically. The clue is in the name. If you put gardeners in charge of the street, you'd get gardens. Uh, so we're, we're saying, so how many things can we put into this complex system called the street, recognizing the street can produce biodiversity, conviviality, social life, as well as commerce. Uh, technology is part of that, of course, but it's not really the driving point. So we're trying to understand what a street can do, or indeed what a school could do, a forest, a port, and so on. Those are our environment for missions. So next slide. So the mission that emerged was use the existing street, use the existing streets in Sweden. They're, they're everywhere. We've built most of them for the next 20 years or so over the last century. So how do we get them to produce healthy, sustainable, vibrant environments? So next slide. So just some numbers there, ignore the text really, but the, um, the blue text on the right gives you an idea. There's 40,000 kilometers of existing street, that's 600 square kilometers, six times the size of Paris. Uh, we've actually built more parking space per person than living space. So how would we use that as an innovation environment? Effectively point that at the problem. And that's far bigger than any innovation budget, to be clear. The, you know, the annual budget for the city of Gothenburg is 10 times what the innovation agency at the national level is, what, what, what I work for. So you use that existing investment, that existing system, and point to a different outcome. This is where directionality comes in, of course. So the directions are pretty much set, though, actually, either at the sustainable development goals level, the global goals, or at the city level, or at the national level. We pretty much have our targets in place. The question is, how do you point the existing world at those targets? So now we're drilling down into the room here. We're getting, again, more stakeholders from the front line in the room at the same time, all working together. We call these system in the room workshops. Next slide, please. So and then we work with Stockholm Stad in the first instance, the municipality who found some streets for us uh, to work with. These are four streets, but you can see they're completely dead, if I can put it like that. They're basically used as parking space, but these are right next to schools. So then what we did is we got the school kids to be the redesigners of these streets. And that's six-year-olds then working as urban designers. They are the experts in these streets, to be honest, because those bits of street are dominated by the school. So we let them design it. Next slide, please. We also let the Prime Minister, Stefan Nadin, have a go at this kind of exercise and the Health Minister there before she was busy with other things. Um, so I won't say who was better at this exercise, the school kids or the Prime Minister, but if you go to the next slide, please. These are the kind of outputs you get from that. So this is really now the nitty gritty of how do you exert change on the ground? And we're pulling multiple actors together here, school kids, but also tech companies. Ericsson, municipalities, all in the room at the same time, the National Transport Regulatory Authority, who can change the law around parking spaces, as well as school children. So next slide, please. Then uh, we worked with Arcters, the National Center for Architecture and Design, who commissioned a kit of parts that could build out in the streets. Next slide, please. Which becomes effectively uh, turned into plans. Next slide, please. And here they are. So this is then the prototypes out. Now these prototypes are one-offs in a way, but they're, as with a prototype, they're built to scale. So these designed to fit into parking spaces. And again, we are showing the amount of space that we have to work with. A lot of space effectively. We've got um, 40,000 kilometers of street like this. This begins us to change it directly. And the key thing is that the street itself is defining what happens here. So if the street says it wants bike parking, then fine. If it wants more greenery, if it wants playground equipment, if it wants cafe tables, these are things that you can do at a super local level. So we're really building a very participative environment around deciding what happens there. Again, there's tech in here. This is computer aided manufacturing of Swedish timber producing these things. So there's um, entirely new tech going on as well as augmented reality, citizen participation toolkits, all of that's in there, but the output is greenery, social spaces. So here's a very complex system model, if you like, behind this, I won't bore you with the details, but if you go to the next slide, it'll zoom in a little bit, I think. This is just saying the value model this produces is quite diverse if you approach it again in this systemic way, so not from a siloed way. All of these little white bits here are bits of research that exist. You know, biodiversity researchers know if you change traffic noise, you get increased bird song, which helps you recuperate from illnesses or increases your mental health. And those researchers are doing all of the work in that area. What's rarely brought together is that alongside the maintenance question, alongside the property development question, alongside the public health 
the skills transformation and so on. So these simple wooden interventions are unlocking all of that if you approach it in a systemic way, which is why it's interesting to think about scaling now, because the value this produces is far greater than the parking space that was previously there. That gives us a rationale for change and investment and scaling. So next slide. And just some quick feedback how these numbers really didn't work when translated to Google Slides, but the key numbers to look at there are the ones in the green circles. This is the feedback from residents and users, 70 to 74% positive, which is pretty good given we're taking parking space away, which usually I get the death threats for. So this is a, a positive thing. And this is just a visualization of how the mission is working um, alongside other things, transforming the electricity grid, transforming the retail environments. We have a series of projects that are aligned under that simple uh, triangle there called the street. So this is the street working as an umbrella to align multiple projects in a portfolio. Next slide. Then I'll quickly whiz through this one. I think I've got a minute or so left. So school food, exactly the same principle. So this is from our food mission area. And this one is about how could we use the existing food system. So again, half of the meals served in Sweden every day through the public meal system. That's about 2 million meals a day. So 700,000 also in related public meals like aged care. That's 7 billion crowns a year, which again is twice the innovation agency's budget. So if I'm thinking about where is the funding or the investment to use for this kind of thing, can we take the existing budget from the school food system and instead of orienting it around cost and hygiene, orient it around sustainability and health and regenerative agriculture and business as well as cost and hygiene. So this is a new recipe for school food that says in Swedish. Next slide, please. And again, we built a system map here. We did this a lot more rigorously, including probably three to 400 different organizations working through in these co-creation sessions. We've now started producing media about this online. So you'll see some videos out there about turning unhappy kids into happy kids, basically, and changing curriculum along the way. And this is now a live procurement Again, this is with uh, Lives Metals Verke, which is the food agency and Vinova um, working together, which is relatively unusual, I would say, uh, on a call for municipalities to now do prototypes around school food. So four municipalities are gonna get picked in the next uh, month or so, next slide. So again, there's uh, multiple projects aligned under one mission, school food, which is part of a bigger mission involving retail and farming and new types of food to transform the food system. So finally, I'll just sum up. So it's direction led, but many of those directions exist, so that we still need to point things in those directions. You build in participation right from the start to, to co-create what things are. Uh, Place-based innovation unlocks the systems actually, because they are systemic, they're the most powerful way. Ignore sectors, they're just a silo. They think about systems like places. Use the existing value, the embedded systems that are there and use technology in the context of people in place multiple people come together, private, public, third. Prototypes are a great way of getting understanding out and building political capital as you go. So don't start with political capital, that's really hard, but build it through evidence gathered from the ground and that enables you to scale to a national mission after starting local. Continuous engagement is required to make this happen, by the way, not fire and forget. And there's a platform strategy underpinning it, which I didn't go into, but basically is aligning the entire system around these prototypes. And finally, just a note on how it's changed how we work as the agency, we're now very clear that we're the sort of cement between the bricks here, working to build uh, collaboration, to build networks for people that can get the missions done. So that's our particular role as an agency. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Oh, I forgot. One last quote from a systems theorist. Small islands of coherence have the potential to change the whole system. <laughs> Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. And thank you for being that small island of coherence um, amid um, so much. I was thinking of that, that word cloud as that, that complexity, bringing some, some coherence to that. We're going to do the Q&A um, later in the, uh, after all of our lightning talks. So what we'll do is store up the questions. And again, I'll come, and, I'll come to those um, who put them in the chat along the way. But we're going to move quite quickly on to um, Jordi Garcia, who is from INISA, the National Innovation Agency in Spain. He's going to take us through um, the perspectives. We have broadly looked at them from, from three different perspectives. From Jordi, we're going to look at the perspective of the funder. From Kirsten and Hannah, we're going to look at from the perspective as of the coordination. And from Sharad in, um, uh, in London, we're going to look at 
from the perspective of the implementer. There are complexities in all of that. So they all play all of these roles as well in some way. So I will pass over directly to Jordi, if you're ready, um, to do your presentation. Hello, uh, buenas tardes, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, OPSI, uh, OCDE, and also IIPP. And congratulations to Dan Hill, uh, because it's a, <laughs> a very, a very top uh, presentation. Uh, I think it's a good example for, for all of us. Okay, uh, ENISA is, uh, uh, depends 100% of the Ministry of Industry of Spain, and, and we uh, 20, we are 20 years ago, uh, we start giving participative loans. So financing SME, innovative SME and startups. So uh, we have the experience and we have been inside 6,000, uh, the more 6,000 uh, more innovative uh, companies in, in Spain. Uh, this is important because when we decided to, to to put direction to missions uh, two years ago, uh, we started uh, with a, a very wide, wide uh, um, experience and, and knowledge about all the sectors and the transformations of each of them. Uh, we have decided in left hand side, you can see, see four pillars. So, so focus, industry, uh, gender equality, territorial balance and impact investment. In that last one is where we uh, determine or decide, choose the, the four missions. It's sustainable mobility, so redesign mobility as, as others, as you seen, have seen. Access, universal access to housing, the new edification uh, construction. Uh, secure health, so when you uh, uh, take care of yourself and also when you take care of the others, the, the two uh, aspects of health. And, and then the rural agri-food activation. So uh, we have in, in Spain a lot of, of territory that is being despoblated, there's uh, less people each day. Uh, at the same time, this is the, where the agriculture and the agri-food has its roots. So it's, it's the, the fourth mission. So this, this was the, the last part of, sorry, if you can go before, uh, the last, uh, uh, after two years of thinking, talking with the ecosystem, with actors, with uh, startups about these four missions, now we have the opportunity in the last three, in the next three years to use the recovery plan, the European recovery plan uh, funds to, to implement that, this uh, effectively. No? And the focus for ENISA, and this is the, the bottom right uh, bullet points, are the decisions that we have chosen, we have uh, taken, uh, because we are in the industry and the SME policy. No? The first is that uh, mission is not only for big corps, it's also for entrepreneurs and innovative SME. They are the, the ones being 100% disruptive, disruptive, the big corps are not 100%, uh, of course. Uh, we focus on industrial and business perspective, more than science and basic R&D. Uh, it's, it's also important that the both are important, but uh, usually I think, uh, in my opinion, is that usually the countries uh, are more um, willing to, to push the R&D. Uh, and, and the industrial and business perspective is is, is not so much uh, taken into account. No? So our focus is that. The third is bottom-up discovery process. Uh, we also think that top-down planified decision is, is important, but we are more coordinating the conversation in, from the bottom-up discovery process, no? and, and then decide when, after listening to all. No? And the fourth is the local entrepreneurship ecosystem network. So the national or global value chains uh, I think that they are the agents who will change the, uh, our lifestyle and, and products and services. But the local entrepreneurship ecosystem network, so the, the, the local nodes are, are crucial in the same time. So this is our approach. Uh, now, yes, the next slide. Uh, I will show 
how we organize these these missions that we we have named tracking projects program. Uh, we, we have decided these four tracking strategies, uh, the four missions. Here, there is oh, there will be a manager or a team and a business advisor council. And then each tracking strategy will have two, three challenges. So it's like uh, in the Vinnova case, three or four sub submissions or, sub, uh, or parts of the mission, no? the components. And if oh, in each of these challenges, will have different multiple solutions to the same challenge. And then we will give them some time to, to prepare the plan, uh, linking different local nodes, as, as I said. And then some of them will be rejected and some of them will be transformed to PPP, so uh, public-private uh, partnerships. And during three, four, five years, we'll have these objectives and, and uh, their product services uh, solutions uh, put it into reality. And the next slide, uh, for example, for this uh, tracking strategy number three, that is redesigning mobility, the metrics uh, would be some something like this. Is this an example? It's not uh, the real, definitive, uh, final one. Uh, increase sustainability mobility in order um, areas to eighty percent in four or five years and reduce aggregate mobility by 40% without losing quality of life, work and services. And in this case, for example, it could be uh, discovered these three challenges. That is for, for one side, optimal logistics and distribution with collaborative data and systems. Another that could be urban redesign for closure and remote access to the needs of the new lifestyle. And the third could be design and manufacture of viable clean vehicles. No? Each of these three challenges have different solutions. No? And, and here you can see some of them. And each one of them has concerned sectors. Also, here is not in the slide, but SDG. We have decided four crucial SDG uh, addressed with each one of the, of the challenges. Key agents. Uh, especially, uh, we have 100 uh, top startups changing this 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 line this uh, with solutions with this challenge. This is uh, uh, inside Enisa, so we have the, the information very close. And then local entrepreneurship ecosystems. So uh, Barcelona uh, is pushing uh, to change the the, the style or the, the mobility style. Uh, with urbanization and with uh, new new kind of vehicles, so Barcelona can share this this mission with Malaga uh, and with Bilbao and with Madrid, or also with some other region or local node in France or in Italy or so. So construct this uh, this network in in Spain and also in the European Union. No? So this would be. Something like an example, and to final the final slide, this is our this is our these are our next or current challenges. The first is that as we see, our approach is only a part, a little part of the puzzle, puzzle, and we have to uh, work with other ministries and other entities in the public and the private, and this is very different, difficult, uh, but. But this is the way, and, and we are investing in that. The second thing is assure good impact metrics. Uh, in, in the industry ministry, we, we are not the ones putting the, the metrics, the KPI. It has to be the, the experts or other ministries. And November, this November, we have done some workshops with all these uh, representatives of the ecosystem. And the third one is do not die in the in the attempt against bureaucracy and all administrative instruments. Uh, as you say, changing the, the policy means that we have to change also the, 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 the culture and the, and the processes. No? And here there is another opportunity because the European recovery plan is also a reform plan. So uh, we, are, we are on the way to, to change this, this administrative structure and, and rules to, to adapt to this new policy. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Geordie. Um, I think that before we move on to the next coordination um, perspective, I do think I've had a, a small plea in the private chat for a quick comfort break. So I think that we should, I should allow um, anyone who wants to just quickly breathe and maybe get a glass of water, a three minute break um, to just absorb what you've just taken in. And, and also please, and as we are all in, in plenary, do join me in thanking Geordie and, um, and Dan for those excellent presentations. Those were really, really excellent and deep case studies. So giving you a bit of a moment for a, for a cogitation and processing of that before we go straight in for another two case studies. Um, I'm going to suggest that we turn the music on if that's all right, Pira. I don't know if that's easy. If that's hard, don't worry. Um, and um, give you three minutes to go and get a cup of tea or a, a glass of water. Um, and then we come back here um, at what will be your 1442, 1442, if that works, it's a bit specific, but, um, and then we will move on. I think it will just give everyone a little bit of a moment to breathe. Oh, thank you, Pirat. The music is on. So three minutes, you have three minutes. Okay, we're back in the room, back in the room. Thank you, Pirat, for the for musical interlude. Um, I think we, we will try and claw back some of the time, but I also don't want to not give you the break time to be able to breathe between these, these sessions, because there's a lot that we're trying to, to do in, in this meeting. Um, but I am really excited now, if you want to share the slides again, Pirat, to pass um, over to... Um, uh, our, our next case, lightning case study, which I believe is from Hannah and Kirsten from, yes, from uh, Health Holland, and to talk a little bit about what it is 
to coordinate missions. So um, Kirsten and Hannah, can you join us? Can you please? Thank you, Rowan, uh, for the introduction and uh, for the invitation here to speak with you about the mission-driven innovation policy in the Netherlands. Uh, my name is Hannah Groen. I work as a strategy advisor at Health Holland. And after the fi first five slides, uh, Kirsten van Spronsen will uh, continue about uh, um, implementation and coordination of implementation. Next slide, please. Health Holland is the organization in the Netherlands that is coordinating the execution of the missions within the societal team health and care. But we certainly do not realize these missions alone. There are a lot of public and private uh, stakeholders involved. Next slide. And to give you briefly a bit of context, our cabinet uh, adopted the mission driven innovation policy in 2020 focusing on uh, four societal themes uh, displayed here, uh, energy transition and sustainability, agriculture, water and food, and safety. And um, our Ministry of Economic Affairs is the process owner of this policy. And when we uh, dive in, uh, um, focusing on health and care, we have uh, 97 partners that um, committed in-kind and cash over 1 billion um, is allocated to the missions of health and care in 2020. And we have a governance model uh, of the 24 core partners uh, on this team. Next slide. The central missions uh, mission of health and care uh, focused on uh, living longer in good health um, for Dutch citizens and uh, most important, uh, decreasing health inequalities. Not an easy job uh, to do. And the central mission is uh, supported by four um, other missions uh, that are really uh, connected to one another. Um, lifestyle and environment, availability of care, uh, people with chronic diseases and people with dementia. And Kirsten will uh, dive into the fourth mission uh, in one minute. Uh, next slide. But we would like to emphasize that um, uh, in the Netherlands, we already work for quite some time uh, very strongly together in a triple helix structure with researchers, entrepreneurs and government in so-called public-private partnerships. But uh, in this mission-driven policy uh, throughout the whole innovation uh, chain, uh, citizens are involved and we uh, do speak in this whole uh, tra uh, trajet uh, of a credible helix uh, structure. Uh, next slide. And Kirsten yeah. will continue. Yeah. Thanks, Anna. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, yeah, we try to really focus on uh, in this presentation on the fourth mission, the people with dementia and the quality of life increasing that. And by focusing that, we have to consider that we are talking about a big transformation and then we have to take into account that it's if we have to have a new narrative next slide please and one of the first chapters in that new narrative is co-creation talking about that a lot right now um, and we're doing that with the quadruple helix as hannah was just talking about and that's really working with the people where it's all about that's working at the place where the sense of urgency is um is really the highest with those next slide please who are willing and in order to co-create we have to facilitate and create those connections that's that what we do as an organization because by facilitating those connections we really um yeah they understand each other's urgencies each other's worlds even more that's on a local scale but that's also and maybe even more on uh, between the local and the national scale, so the local initiatives and the national institutes. Um, and the model on the next slide illustrates the needs for those connections. It's a multi-level perspective and it describes the process. Uh, can you do the next slide already? It describes the process uh, of the sustainable transition. Um, and the starting point uh, ah, okay, this is still an old figure, but never mind. Um, the starting point, the upper layer, you see the landscape layer, it's a situation we're now dealing in. Well, and you see obviously what we're talking about, but not only that, it's also a growing amount of people with dementia. 
the fourth mission we're now talking about. And the second layer is referring to the infrastructure. So the system we always talk about, you know, the healthcare, um, insurance, uh, the hospitals. The third layer refers to the innovative ideas of the people who really feel the sense of urgency, who really know the needs and know the purpose. And those solutions of that people always meet the needs, but not always fit into the system and therefore are most of the time not automatically structurally implemented. Next slide, please. So what we decided in our role as a coordinator of the missions is to simply swap it around. In the field labs, which is our, one of our instruments uh, to implement the missions, um, the initiatives that really meet the needs are the starting point. Are the starting point to grow in a different direction. And a perfect example, next slide please, is Tante Louise. It's a Dutch name of a healthcare organization for people also with dementia. And what they did is one, they facilitated connections by simply inviting the whole village uh, to share their dream. And second of all, they started co-creation by asking everyone in the room, like, okay, how would you like to contribute to this dream? And we're talking about, well, I mean, the bakery in the corner and the neighbors uh, and the municipality, but also research institutes and the bigger companies. And next slide, please. The result was much better than they could ever have dreamed of because there's now freedom for all residents enabled by technology in a co-creation community. And the process now repeats itself because all the people also with dementia walking freely around a village, which is, as you know, not very really normal in every stage of dementia. Now it's facilitating again and again, those connections and the co-creation uh, process starts itself again. Next slide, please. And this starting point is our beginning for our monitoring. So it's a vision of a world where missions are already accomplished, as you can see now a very, very small part of. And this vision is designed with the experts of the quadruple helix on the local level, on the regional level, on the national level. And with them, with that whole coalition, it's also monitored what we're doing all together to achieve, to accomplish those missions. And next slide, please. Whereas we now do that on a local and a regional and national level, why not broaden our horizon even more and do this with you on an international scope? So let's join our forces together. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. And you can always get in touch with us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Hannah and Kirsten, and, and for, for whipping through what is such a complex strategy. Um, and what I'm delighted about seeing these mission in action case studies is that they are really talking to all different kinds of missions. So it's really interesting to see a public health mission and particularly a dementia featured with dementia featured within it. So really thinking about what does it mean to co-create with different members of the public was really interesting there. I'm now going to pass over to Sharad, who is going to talk about something completely different, um, really focusing on a mission that that um, brings out the discipline of engineering. So working with the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK and deploying the Newton Fund, which is a, a government focused innovation fund and setting up what he will explain to you, Engineering X, which is the mission oriented organization that is focusing on how engineering can enable particular missions. I'll pass over to you, Sherrod. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rowan. Um, firstly, thanks to yourselves at Dolly WP for inviting me along. It's really a pleasure to be here. Hard acts to follow uh, after all those fantastic presentations, but I'll do my best. Uh, my name is Sherrod Sharma. Um, as Rowan mentioned, I've been leading the development of Engineering X, um, which is an initiative of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Uh, and the Lloyd's Register Foundation. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so this is our tagline, bringing global experts together to engineer change. I'll go through the next slide, please. 
And essentially, um, so we are a bit different to what's been presented um, uh, or the perspectives um, that have been um, sort of showcased uh, before. Uh, we aren't a public funding agency, we're a national academy. Um, we have uh, engineering expertise within our fellowship. Uh, so 1,600 of the UK's best uh, engineers uh, and the world's best engineers uh, sit in that fellowship from academia and industry. Um, and basically um, our role is to foster that excellence and to drive it towards um, uh, and, and uh, meeting societal sort of ambitions, um, sustainable society and an inclusive economy um, are, are the academy's ambitions. Um, and Engineering X is basically our attempt at trying to sort of globalize or use our global, vast global networks um, to tackle global grand challenges. Um, so over the past five, six years through principally UK development funding, um, we've grown a really large cadre uh, of a thousand plus uh, sort of innovators that we've supported through training uh, exercises, um, universities who are now collaborating with local stakeholders, um, about a thousand organizations supported through grants uh, to work on development challenges. Um, so bottom up programming, uh, mainly in low and middle income countries, um, and trying to use that network and galvanize uh, that network towards addressing um, certain challenges. Next slide, please. So this is the kind of distinctive role that we play. Uh, obviously, uh, Engineering X, Engineering Community must play a distinctive, positive, have a distinctive contribution to make um, within the, 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 the challenge um, that we're addressing. Um, we require that the sort of the mission uh, or the challenge that we um, want to address has this sort of complex and global character uh, requiring collaboration across geographies, sectors, disciplines. We're not so much on the sort of big research and innovation funding side, um, but we are about sort of taking existing knowledge, existing practices and, you know, uh, diffusing that and spreading that knowledge to where it's most needed. Um, as well. Uh, and of course, where there's sort of targeted research and innovation solutions that are needed um, uh, and that can high have, have high impact where we're open to that, but we're not, we're not the kind of multi-million pound research and innovation um, uh, funders um, doing, uh, supporting deep R&D collaborations. Next slide, please. And this is the way we organize ourselves. So uh, in the missions that we do um, uh, choose to undertake, um, we want to have systemic impact uh, and we want deep engagement with diverse communities. Those are our sort of goals. Uh, and then uh, we, we, we do those through, uh, implement our missions through three means, uh, evidence and insights, trying to understand the character and the nature, the scale of the issue globally, uh, grants and awards to sort of support people um, and organizations to do something about it. Uh, and then ensuring that we sort of build that community and engage um, with you know, a broad set of stakeholders uh, as well to secure their buy-in uh, and listen to their voices whilst we're sort of designing uh, and implementing the missions too. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so on the next slide, please, uh, I'll talk through. Uh, so we currently have five sets of, uh, a set of five missions, um, transforming systems through partnership, which looks to build sort of cross-sector uh, engineering partnerships, universities working with uh, local government, businesses, entrepreneurs um, and communities to tackle uh, local SDG challenges, uh, safer complex systems, which is trying to improve the safety um, of increasingly complex uh, engineered and non-engineered um, uh, systems uh, and improve their sort of reliability and resilience as well. Engineering skills where they're most needed. Um, uh, looking mainly in low middle income countries to build engineering capacity um, for uh, the development, maintenance and operation of critical infrastructure, but also so we can deploy um, uh, emerging technologies there to meet local challenges. Uh, and then a recent one around pandemic preparedness as well. Next slide, please. But the fifth mission that I, I was going to sort of deep dive into um, was our, our one around sort of safer end of engineered life, uh, which is looking to support safer disposal and decommissioning of engineered artifacts at the end of their life. Um, so be it medical devices, electronic devices, um, 
vehicles um, or in, indeed ships and offshore structures, which is what we've sort of uh, kicked off at. All these things um, do end up somewhere and what happens to them, where do they end up firstly and what happens to them uh, at the end of their life is often um, that the risk of doing the dangerous work of disposing uh, and um, um, breaking these things apart uh, is left to the places which are least capable of managing them. Um, and so the, the issue that we're trying to tackle is to improve the safety with which we do that. And so we've undertaken a global review on safer end of engineered life that's about to come out. And it's pointing out, uh, pointing to um, open burning of waste, uh, of engineered waste being the sort of most significant um, uh, safety issue uh, globally um, uh, that's, um, that's occurring. Uh, we use uh, projects and grant funding, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And we obviously convene uh, workshops uh, and we have one on, on open burning uh, happening early next year. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of mission design, I just wanted to sort of touch on this uh, and it's kind of a deliberately amateur <laughs> um, uh, portrayal because this is what we started out at. Uh, and you know, I think you've seen what I wanted to sort of convey um, with this slide is that you know, the framework for us was exceptionally helpful in navigating uncertainty. Um, we didn't have, you know, we we have engineering expertise, mostly based in the UK, top top global technical experts uh, on their specific field for this uh, for this uh, mission. Uh, we have a geotechnical uh, engineer specialist in soil, soil compaction uh, around infrastructure and sites and railways. Um, so but with a huge passion for the environment and environmental engineering, but not necessarily the knowledge of how all this stuff plays out globally uh, in very messy situations. And so with the, what the framework allowed us to do was kind of put it all on a map, allow us to sort of understand, okay, what are the types of stakeholders that we need to engage with to improve our understanding of the issue? And then how do we, you know, because it's so broad as well, there, as, as I just mentioned, everything from ships to medical to electronic, these are completely different sectors, even within the sectors themselves, so many different types of device and types of problems as well. So we're really looking at quite broad issues. How do we structure it so that we feel, you know, even as a management tool for ourselves, uh, try to do something about it, which is meaningful, um, and um, uh, with the little resources that we have and the, and, and the vast network as well. So that's really what I was trying to sort of get across. I was really excited to see, I think in the OECD presentation earlier on uh, around the, um, the design of the canvas, the mission design canvas. Um, and I think I really do wanna sort of portray with this slide and with the use of that tool that you don't need to have all the answers at the beginning uh, you don't need to have all the information, you know, put it out there, put it on a deck, um, you know, use that canvas to try and sketch out um, what, what a mission might look like. And then you can learn and adapt on the way. So uh, if I can get to the next slide, please. And I think this is where sort of Rowan, you asked me to sort of come in and, you know, try to give a voice from the ground on actually implementation um, and adaptation. Um, of, 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 of missions. So as I said, we, we, we kicked off um, with a broad understanding of the issues, specifically in this, in, in this slide, I'll be talking about our work in offshore structures and ships. Uh, so 90% of the world's ships and offshore structures land up in beaches in South Asia and are disposed and dismantled, oftentimes mostly uh, in incredibly unsafe ways, causing um, hazards to local populations and, of course, environmental contamination too. Um, so what we did uh, at the beginning was try to convene a workshop, a global workshop in London, put the system in a room. You would have heard that uh, uh, phrase uh, quite a bit uh, uh, over the course of the, the, the few presentations. But, you know, all the way from workers' rights, um, advocates, um, trade union organizations in South Asia, um, policy makers, regulators, um, uh, oil and gas majors, BP, Shell, 
um, uh, along the way, academic groups looking at naval architecture uh, to sort of um, ship um, uh, uh, and um, sorry, ship operations um, as well. Put them on the in the room and try to build that sort of collective agreement uh, and collective intelligence as to you know what is the issue here, uh, how does it play out in all these different um, sort of local situations? How do they join up? Uh, which is where you see that kind of the network map there that, that, that we asked them to create. Um, and you know, what can we do about it? And I think what was really interesting and important in building that workshop and putting that system in the room uh, is you know, really leveraging the networks of networks. Not any one person knows everything, but they can put you in touch with somebody. And so, uh, and then again, um, and trying to build your own knowledge uh, of the situation uh, and be relatively open and exploratory in the way uh, that you uh, approach conversations and always ask, is there somebody else we should be speaking to? Very time intensive, uh, it does require a lot, uh, but at the end of the day, you do, you do benefit from that. So following that workshop, uh, and it was following that workshop, we um, developed a funding program for collaboration based upon our knowledge that we got from, um, uh, from convening that meeting. And then we put in a sort of two-stage uh, review process. Um, the first stage be you know, asking that community that we convened to um, come and, um, and present their proposals. Uh, we mainly asked them to collaborate amongst each other, but we allowed them to also connect in uh, when they went back home with local, local stakeholders. Um, and then from the first stage, of course, we, we, um, we, uh, we, we got the proposals, we gave content feedback, but where we saw there were projects that were either aligned, we asked them to get in touch with each other, or in fact, where there's a, some, there were often leads in one project, which could then be sort of uh, co-investigators of another, uh, or co-leads or participants, and really try to build that thread through the portfolio of the six projects um, that we um, that we ended up funding, and uh, the funding uh, is such that we give. Sorry, uh, just the last uh, slide. I, I'll, I'll try to be quick. <laughs> um, and um, in terms of the the annual review process that we have for the funding, builds on to the last uh, point. There, we will be constant. We're constantly um, sort of doing outreach ourselves at the mission level or the program level but also the participants themselves uh, to um, sort of um, crowd in stakeholders into this, uh, into this area. And so the annual review process of the funding allows us to almost plug in those stakeholders into the existing funding and ask the projects um, if they can uh, to sort of build in uh, new stakeholders uh, and those new collaborations into existing projects, or, or in fact, if they felt like they wanted to adapt further. Um, that, that 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 process allows them to, to, to do that and really to try to generate that coalition uh, of people globally uh, acting in this space um, to try and affect real uh, change across the industry. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, humble learnings from our side. Um, uh, it's incredibly helpful navigating its uh, uncertainty, the framework, um, and encouraging exploration. It can be uncomfortable. Um, it's not easy, you know, going from a sort of defined process to something that's quite so open and that can change with any com new conversation that you have. Um, but, um, but I think it's rewarding uh, at the end of the day. Um, linked into that, don't nail down on a program or solution too early on. It's far too easy to say, you know, oh, we've got 10 million pounds, let's give 10 grants, a million each uh, for, uh, and then, you know, expect things to happen. Um, that's not really how uh, if you are trying to address um, and build a project uh, across a complex system, which is touching up different uh, leverage points, you won't get that from, from the easy way of doing things. Um, it does take a lot of um, understanding from your part and building that capability within yourselves um, too. Um, and it requires you to be very inclusive in the community you build, listen to underrepresented voices um, especially these people who don't normally have a say uh, in, so in, your, in, in your sales field policy making. Um, I think it is really important, not just in terms of the voice, 
but also, as I mentioned earlier, um, we, we, had a, we have another mission on safer complex systems. Without listening to underrepresented voices, you really risk um, causing quite grave safety issues on certain people uh, as well. So um, it's really important to get their perspectives uh, to uh, mitigate against uh, unintended consequences. Don't duplicate, collaborate when you're scoping your missions and the funding programs, assessing who else is out there. Um, I think as Dan brought up in his presentation, not everything's about funding, there's existing um, uh, assets, if you will, um, and you'll be able to leverage those uh, if, if you think quite creatively um, uh, uh, too. So, uh, and lastly, I just wanted to say, you know, remember what makes collaborations work. Uh, and it's the next slide, please. It's all about the people. Uh, and you've got to really think about the, what kinds of relationships you want to create. So in the, in the, in the, in the word cloud, it was so interesting to see, you know, ecosystems and I think stakeholders, silos, you know, these are all about creating relationships across which break those silos, which create those ecosystems, get some knowledge flowing from one actor to the other. Um, and so this, this slide uh, comes from actually a, um, a review that our former president, Damon Dowling, did of University Business Cl Research Collaboration. Mm -hmm. And it's breaking down uh, the 10 top success factors in what makes those innovation collaborations, those R&D collaborations work, so that research can go into um, uh, industry and have an impact. Um, and most of those key success factors you'll see is all around the relationships. The funding comes in at number six, IP at number seven, but mostly it's about getting those trusted personal relationships, that mutual understanding, uh, the shared vision. And so I thought I'd, I'd, I'd share that because, you know, in, from a sort of design centric perspective, um, you know, that's really what we want to create is the new relationships that last, that sustain and that, that do um, uh, impactful things along the way. Um, next slide, please. Um, and yeah, this is sort of the closing remarks. Um, so that's a, um, a picture of our CEO, uh, Dr. Hyatton Sillam, um, who's speaking at the launch um, uh, and really a message to say, you know, please join us if any of those missions um, that you uh, see sort of um, uh, resonates with yourselves and, you know, please get in touch. We're very open. I think another thing that I wanted to say actually on the mission design side is, What's lovely about the framework it has, is that it allows just so many entry points for people to come in uh, and to work with you. Um, and so I'm sure we'll be able to find some meaningful way of, of working with yourselves on these, but also we're open to opening our networks and working on other missions with, uh, with other funders. Just one last point that I forgot to mention is around terminology. I think there was, there's a big, big, um, push around changing the narrative. I speak to engineers all the time. Engineers are very practical people uh, and they don't always respond well to these kind of slightly more abstract concepts um, uh, around sort of missions and how you frame them. You don't need to be selling the way you do things uh, and using that terminology to everybody. Not everybody needs to, needs to really have a good grasp of what you're doing. They need to know what your entry point is with them, what, what's needed from them. And then you can sort of slowly build in after that um, the, uh, the, the, the terminology and sell the concept to them. But I think if you're looking at breaking down silos, getting those entry points uh, and, and working um, uh, with, with other stakeholders, um, I think it is important uh, to sort of know that um, uh, and not everybody needs to know the whole story at the first, <laughs> first point of contact and talking in their language, at least at the beginning, and then building in the missions possibly um, as the relationships develop. So next slide, please. Yeah, exactly. So I will, I will end there. That's my closing slide. I hope you uh, gain something <laughs> from, from my remarks. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Sharad. Um, I think, you know, I would, I would summarise that in the teamwork makes the dream work, um, that, that actually this is a, a people strategy, not just a, 
a, st a structuring policy or organizing and moving around the chairs it's actually very much a process of engagement and long-term engagement as well so commitment is part of the narrative you can't build a narrative and then without followers or, or people who are engaged in doing the work it's not going to go anywhere so those were really important insights we are running about 10 minutes over time and we do want to make sure we have a hard stop at um, the end of Vegas it's a three-hour workshop and we're so delighted that so many of you have st stuck around with us all the way through so three hours out of someone's day and sometimes some out of people's nights um, this is quite an interesting one so because we've had so many questions in the Q&A what and and um, you know some of some of the speakers have actually tried to address them actually um, as they've come I'm just going to put out one question um, and that was the question particularly from Jessica um, who had said you know how long did you take to co-create missions um, and managing the balance of urgency to get on with solutions and the time to define the problem right at the outset now I think that that can can be you know deployed to all of our case studies. So I thought it might be worth to just say, could we have kind of one or two uh, or, or less than a minute from each, just to say, how did you go about doing the co-creation of the strategy, and and what would you say were your your lessons about how to do it? And then what I'll promise from um, all of the, we will harvest all of these questions and we will ensure that we come back to you with insights that we've, we've um, brought in from our speakers. So Dan, if you want to, to come in first as, it's, as you were the first speaker. Sure, and actually there's a really good detailed response to that from my colleague, uh, Jenny. If you scroll up in the chat to 2.46 p.m., <laughs> you'll see uh, Jenny Hoerblum. Um, has described on the school food side in some detail what we did. So you can have a look at that. But in essence, I'd say we had about two or three people working on each mission area, two or three on food, two or three on mobility. We took about six months doing all of that co-creation, co-design, engagement, workshops, blah, 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 probably 300 organizations on food and the equivalent number on mobility. Um, and then we took about six months really distilling that, co-creating prototypes, building relationships, a lot of work by Jenny and the team on the school food side, coordinating all of the national agencies into a more of a systemic approach, I guess, and on the mobility side, um, designing and delivering those prototypes. So maybe a year, I guess, uh, which maybe seems a lot, we only have nine years left for the SDGs, but then, <laughs> Uh, it's hard, it's hard stuff. And then doing that design work up front, we're trying to build something that you could then scale quite quickly. So as you saw with the street stuff, we're trying to design something that you could then invest in and scale rapidly, having spent a bit more time up front on the research and design side. Does that help? Fabulous, that's great. Um, uh, Georgie, do you want to speak a little bit to, the, to your mission yeah. setting process? Yeah, very quick. In, in our case, uh, it's all based in in the startups and, and innovative SME that we have in in our financing instrument. It's uh, actual uh, nowadays uh, three thousand. Uh, and then uh, I think that it could be two years. Uh, the first year is uh, uh, a very pedagogic year, where uh, the concept of missions uh, it has to be to be included in, in the mindset of everybody and it's not a quick thing. Then uh, several phases of contrast with the ecosystems, you know, with the startup, with the, with the local governments, with the experts, the sectorial uh, associations, not so much because we, we are not looking for sectors, we are looking for uh, transforming some sectors at the same time with a, a new opportunity. You know? So as, as, as I ask, uh, I as uh, I put in the chat, uh, it's it's very similar to EDP, the entrepreneurship discovery process that was launched in in RIS3 strategy, the smart specialization strategy in Europe, where, where this, uh, it develops a, a methodology to to share from bottom up, but also to to finally decide top down these missions. So at the end. Two, two years and now we are starting the implementation this, this next year. Fabulous. And Kirsten, do you want to speak to the co-creation project? Yeah, um, I think as Nico already told in the in the chat, it's 
it's quite natural. It's almost a natural habit, whereas we uh, forget that it's also quite uh, difficult sometimes to do that cooperation, that co-creation part in the Netherlands. Um, so that means that especially the new part for us is really co-create with the end user, with the citizens. And we tend to do that by going to the place where the citizen already has its fantastic initiative, which suits the needs, which meets the needs, as already pointed out in the presentation. And when you invite other people um, from that public-private pri uh, partnerships, and you invite them or the ministries or, or whatever, you invite them to go to the place where it actually happens, and you see the initiatives that are actually very, very successful, um, then there changes something in the perspective of all people around. You go where, where the sense of urgency is, is felt the best and everyone thinks like, oh, wait, is that what, what I'm actually doing it for? And then everyone starts to not thinking about, oh my God, actually I have my own rules and my own procedures. No, everyone starts to think, okay, how can we really fix this together? And that's a mind shift we every time and time and time and time again do. Does that answer a little bit of the question? Absolutely, absolutely. So turning it away from being a kind of set of institutions gathering because they have to into being a mission oriented group or network or team. Sharad, I think that you ended with that. In terms of your process, how long would you say that that, that took? How long did it take? Um, so yeah, I, I guess just looking at, thinking about the, the kind of the narrow example that I did around offshore structures and ships. It took about five, four months of you know, really proactive outreach to get those, get a sense of who should be in that room. And then um, after that as well, uh, sort of through the project cycle or the application cycles, uh, plugging people in uh, to, to those in, a, in an adaptive way to funding, I think about just over a year uh, but we are a small organization as well so it might be <laughs> with 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 more resources perhaps you could go a bit a, a bit quicker excellent thank you so much um we're now going to um move to the to the final section of the of today's boot camp it's been a it's been a real roller coaster ride so far and there's been so much knowledge shared um i do want to speak to the fact that the the chat has been so rich as well that we will ensure an endeavor that we get a kind of interim paper back to you when we invite you to the next workshop because we really want to build in the insights but also address some of these questions and there have been some quite tactical questions for our speakers too. things like can you share your annual governance framework and can you share how you did this and what is a platform so I'll aim to to try and get those things to the speakers as well and and lastly I also wanted to mention that um, Sharad last year was one of our Moyne members who actually hosted a placement for our Masters in Public Administration um, and because the one of the upsides and there are very few of the Covid pandemic is that now we are operating almost entirely as a global online platform. And so I did want to open that up to any Moin member who wants to also do that, because we only did them in the UK last year. But if you want to be put in a, an expression of interest to host a placement um, so that you can have some additional capacity to go deep on your mission strategy, um, please let me know and we can we can put that into the into the mix as well, because I think it's an eight-week placement where students are really able to do a deeper dive and research into the work that you're doing and it forms a very symbiotic relationship so just let me know at a, at a different time if that's um, something that is of interest to you but now we're going to perform the magnificent task which is putting you into breakouts to do that Pira is going to give you some overview of how to use the mural board but also I've been told please make sure you have your real name in your zoom um, window because some people have entered in using other people's links so you may have um, someone else's name against you so please rename yourself if you've got the wrong name and then I'll pass over to Pirette to talk about the breakout groups. Excellent thank you very much Rowan. So you will be assigned to uh, four different thematic breakout rooms so we can actually dig down into these challenges that uh, are connected the missions that we have been going through today. And this is going to feed into the work that we're going to do in uh, on the 26th of January, 2021, that we're going to actually work on the tools and methods to do missions in a more 
kind of holistic and systemic way uh, not to use kind of uh, existing tools for the kind of the new and complex challenges that we're facing to uh, facing now. So we can't also assume that the tools and methods that we are already using or we have in place in government or in public agencies are going to actually deliver results on the missions themselves. So we want to really uh, dig down into the kind of the challenges of working in a mission oriented way to actually design or design some principles or tools and methods uh, or a process uh, or sorry, methodology that can help you get started uh, in a context-aware way about how to actually do mission-oriented innovation.